wolf. A scourge of shepherds the world over. Here in India, it's no different. But in looking for the rare Indian wolf, Joe has found something unexpected. It's taken him the best part of three years, living among wolves and shepherds, to discover not only fear and mistrust, but something else too. Brotherhood. His journey has taken him to a place where myth and reality merge. To where a remarkable animal and an ancient way of life have helped him rethink the story of wolves and shepherds. Joe's a student of natural history. And he's on what feels like an impossible mission. He is trying to track down wolves on the south central plains of India. These were once pristine grasslands where cheetahs, wolves and antelopes roamed. Although most of this wilderness has been turned into farms and fields, wolves have clung on. But only by becoming highly secretive. That's why, after a whole year crisscrossing the plains for thousands of kilometers, Joe is yet to see a wolf in the wild. But that will all change soon. One day, some traditional nomadic herd has arrived near the village of Hanchenal, where Joe is camping. The herders are simple people with an ancient way of life. Rugged and medieval. Uncluttered by possessions. Wrapped in myth and belief. With their sheep and belongings in tow, several family groups together roam the plains of South Central India. Throughout the year, they're always on the move, never settling anywhere for long. But their ancient way of life is being pushed to the edge by modernization. There's a local legend that wolves follow these wandering shepherds. Joe doesn't believe in fairy tales, but since he is getting nowhere, he decides to ask whether they can help him in his search. So, he tries to find their leader. Joe is nervous. Nomadic folk are very suspicious of strangers. Ramapa is initially friendly, but when asked about wolves, he begins dodging Joe. One minute he says he knows nothing about wolves. The next, he asks why Joe wants to know about wolves. His reaction is very different from that of the local herders, who simply hate wolves. So Ramapa's response is intriguing. Having heard of the nomad's arrival, soothsayers descend on Ramapa who is glad to have his fortune told for a few rupees and is happy to receive their blessing. Meeting the soothsayers seems partly like an excuse to avoid Joe. Joe thinks Ramapa must know something about wolves. But whether it's fact or just woven into the fabric of his beliefs is hard to guess. Nonetheless, Ramapa could have a major role to play in Joe's quest to study wolves. So Joe takes to walking with him, just talking about this and that to gain his trust. It takes many visits, 
But eventually, it seems that Ramapa simply wants to know that Joe means no harm to wolves. This is such a surprise. As the trust builds between them, Ramapa tells Joe about a big wolf with a bent ear, who's notoriously wily, and who lives close to where Joe is camping. But Ramapa is doubtful that Joe will ever get to know him. He becomes philosophical. He says, the wolves are dust. They can neither be read nor be captured. Joe wonders if Rampapa is talking about their camouflage or their spirit. And indeed, Joe's fruitless search for this big wolf with a bent ear continues for a long time. He starts to wonder if Rampapa was having him on. Or maybe this wolf is a figment of his imagination. Then, one evening in the beautiful fading light, Joe is enjoying watching birds alone, hidden from view. Suddenly, a wild wolf, in the middle of the field, where he has been training his binoculars for the last half hour, It's as if he materialized out of the dust. Just as Rampapa said. Yes, it's a male with the bent ear. So, not a legend after all. He's not just large for an Indian wolf. He's healthy looking. He looks maybe six or seven years old. Around here, where wolves are routinely poisoned or trapped, that's incredible. A real survivor. It is even threatening Joe. Only a very confident animal could do that. Then he disappears. In just as ghostly a fashion. Joe cannot believe his luck. And of course, he wants to see Bent Ear again. Many days pass. But that wolf has disappeared completely from sight. Joe decides that he needs more help. He has been told of a man called Ambrish, who lives in a village nearby and who has very good tracking skills. Ambrish is a farmer and grazier, but is more used to hunting wolves than observing them. Even so, he agrees to join Joe on his mission. In spite of Ambrish's intimate knowledge of the local landscape, they fail to find Bent Ear. Ramapa and his people are moving on to their next destination. And with them, any insight into the legend that wolves follow them wherever they go. Joe knows that wolves stay within their own territories. So how did this legend come about? Maybe it's something they'll never reveal. The origins of their stories are lost in the past. Stories made myth and myths made legend. Man, animal, landscape have become inseparable.
they're simply compelled to follow the rolling clouds, carrying their deeply held beliefs with them. One day, as spring is turning to summer, they catch sight of a wolf. But it's only a pup, and it's all alone. Wolf pups are vulnerable and normally kept close to adult members of a pack. Over the following days, they catch glimpses of other wolf pups. But the pups are always alone, in what seems to be Bent Ears territory. Could they be his? They look more at risk than they should be, especially with so many shepherds' dogs around and with few places to hide. But then on a second thought, maybe it's better they rest up apart from one another. A case of not putting all your eggs in one basket. Perhaps Bent here has had to find novel ways to survive in a largely hostile and ever-changing world. It makes Joe even more determined to see Bent Ear again. Joe's search continues round the clock. But in the unbearable heat, he's starting to hallucinate. Bent Ear has melted away into the landscape. Joe is beginning to doubt that he ever saw that big wolf in the first place. But persistence pays off. One evening, Ambrish and Joe stumble across a female wolf. With great caution, they follow her. She, at last, leads them to Bent Ear. He is calling out softly, in a frequency that Joe can't quite hear. But it's clearly audible to the scattered pups. With their father's ability to magic out of nowhere, they arrive from different directions. There are four in all, and they look about five months old. The family probably regroups only when it is safe. Joe watches them for just a few minutes, until they disappear into the dusk. For Joe, the joy of finding Bent Ear and his family doesn't last long. Five days later, he hears some dreadful news. The reason why Bent Ear and his partner keep their pups in different places is brought home in the most tragic way. The village dogs have found and fatally wounded one of the pups. By the time Joe finds it, the pup is breathing its last. The first time he gets to touch a wild wolf, it dies in his hands. They can neither be read nor be captured. Ramapa's words echo in his ears. That night, the sky opened up and cried. That is it. Joe does not get to see Bent here or his remaining family for a long, long time.
If wolves, like bent here, don't follow nomadic herders, how do they vanish into this landscape? And what do they live on? Ambridge says that they can survive on wild berries. And at first Joe is reluctant to believe him. But then they find some wolf scat. And Ambridge points out the seeds and skins of Zisipra's fruits in it. He goes on to tell that wolves not only eat wild berries, they also feed on tamarind fruits, maize, and even bananas. Bananas! It seems far-fetched. But by now Joe has learned that it is not wise to ignore local knowledge. There is next to no wild prey to hunt or scavenge in this area. Picking off the odd sheep or goat is not going to fill their stomachs. Maybe Ambrish is right. Joe decides to experiment. He sets up camera traps in different places. Many days go by, but nothing much happens. Just as he is about to give up, he sees a wolf in the picture. One of his camera traps has captured a sub-adult wolf eating zisperous fruits. It must be one of Bent Ear's three remaining offspring. Ambrish was right. Now, Joe wants an answer to the banana puzzle. Though it's known that canids can digest vegetable matter, Joe can't quite get his head round a big bad wolf living off bananas. The experiment certainly opened his eyes to the nightlife round here. A fox takes away the banana on one occasion. Next time, it's a jackal. The time after that... It's a civet, but no wolf comes anywhere near. However, Ambrish is adamant that wolves do eat them and refuses to give up. So they try hanging the bananas on a tree and in a different place. A big blunder. At least they have a good laugh about it. The Joe is getting nowhere in really understanding wolf behavior. He keeps trying. And then he gets wolves in the picture. Sub-adults again. Ambrish was right. So-called savage wild wolves do eat bananas. By now, Ramapa has moved a couple of hundred kilometers from Joe's camp. Joe goes looking for him. He's quite friendly with Joe now. He even shares some of his experiences with wolves on his own. He explains, without rancor or bitterness, how the wolves come at night, jump the fences or burrow under the enclosures to steal their sheep. He also tells Joe that some smart wolves pull out the wooden props and dismantle the fence, and adds that Bent Ear, in particular, is an expert in these tactics. It sounds like another myth, and it occurs to Joe. No shepherd would just sit, carefully observing how a wolf steals his sheep. His instinct would be to chase the wolf away, Maybe he reconstructed the events, or at best, saw it in a flash. Still, Joe decides not to rule anything out. Ambrish and Joe construct several hideouts at different pens around the neighborhood, where herders leave their young animals and the sick ones during the day. 
Each day, Joe sits in a different hide, for eight hours at a stretch. Weeks roll by, but he witnesses only the herder's daily routine. Nevertheless, he learns something useful. Some parts of the day, after the men and dogs have gone out with the larger herd, and when women set off to fetch water or disappear for a chat, there is no one around. One evening, Bent Ear's son appears very close to a pen. Maybe it's his first venture without the master thief. He looks nervous. certainly not living up to his father's cunning reputation. He sits down for a think. It's quite a relief for Joe too, when the wolf gives up and moves away. He's happy with how things are going. Encouraged, Joe decides to spend a few nights near the shepherd's camp. And one night, He spots the young wolves again, stalking around the camp. Nowhere. It's hard to pull for sheep. Joe wanders again, and how wolves can possibly survive here? And why are they not seeing Bent Ear anywhere? 
Joe is puzzled. But he's reluctant to give up. He's continuing with his camera trap experiments. And one night, it's bent ear. At last, he too succumbs to bananas. But wait a minute. He just sniffs the bananas. Unlike his sons, he doesn't eat them. He must have sensed something, which his offspring did not. Maybe he somehow learned that food like this can also be poison bait. Caution could be what has kept him alive. Bent Ear is becoming more and more of an enigma for Joe. Thrilled by what he's seeing, Joe spends the following days at the pen where he encountered the young wolf. And then, one hot afternoon, he sees bent ear again. This is Joe's best chance to see the master at work. And bent ear's son has come with him too. Fortunately, the wind is favourable to Joe. But somehow, that suspicious big wild wolf senses something unusual and just walks away. He's adopted a zero-risk strategy in a landscape where one wrong move could be his last. It's quiet for a long time. But later, Bent Ear's son returns. This time, he's alone. Last week, he made a fool of himself. This week, he takes Joe completely by surprise. He seems to be testing every link in the fence for weaknesses. He's taking away the poles from round the pen. He does it again. Clearly, he has a plan to execute. And now, he starts tugging at the rope keeps the whole thing stable. Maybe he's seen his father bent ear, dismantling a pen, and he's trying the same thing. He could only have learnt these tactics from another wolf. He's surely able to improvise to get what he wants.
These wolves, squeezed into the tightest corners of India's south central plains, are proving to be larger than life. This young wolf's audacity just adds to his father's mystique. But Bent Ear has disappeared again. The more Bent Ear vanishes, Joe's desires to see him intensifies. Ambrish and Joe decide to follow the main herds, hoping one day they'll observe their master himself at work. A few days later, they see a wolf. But it's not Bent here. They're his sons. This time they are trailing a flock of local sheep. slipping through the margins like spirits. It takes a lot of skill. The dogs get wind of them. And are sent after them. The young wolves maybe pushed their luck too far today, but they were confident and pretty close to grabbing a lamb. Bent Ear has cleverly trained his youngsters. It's really impressive. Stealing livestock leads to conflict with humans. With very little natural prey in the area, they can't survive without doing this. It's amazing that wolves have clung on here at all. They seem to have managed it by melting away and reappearing at the right times to avoid the wrath of the herders. It's like walking a tight rope all the time. Another day and another chance for Bent Ear's son. First, he assesses the situation. 
and then moves into position. Blending into the pasture of wild flowers, he passes right by the boys playing on the rocks. Then, just as it looks as if the sheep have faced him down, the flock seems to allow him in. It is as if the sheep were making an offering. A wolf seizing its dinner suddenly feels like a favor. Soon after, Ambrish and Joe witness the sub-adults snatched success. They are brought back to reality. They lose Bent Ear's family altogether. As the maze grows tall, it's as if they too become lost in a vast ocean. As time goes by, Joe becomes increasingly anxious about the safety of the wolf family. Especially as the denning season is just weeks away. Then Ambrish hears some vague reports that wolves have been poisoned in a nearby area. He gathers friends from the village to intensify their search. What they find is devastating. The remains suggest the wolves died about two weeks ago. At least three died within a small area. A clear indication they were poisoned. While the rest of the group immerse themselves in the crime scene, Ambrish is lost in thought. This one-time hunter is now reluctant to accept that the family he has followed for the last 18 months is no more. Disheartened, Ambrish takes refuge in his beliefs. The wolf's very existence here is now inseparable from human faith and folklore. Like the wolves, life is getting harder for Rambopal too.
the modern world is giving little space to this ancient lifestyle. Winter has arrived in Hanchenau. On this part of his annual grazing route, Ramapa is arriving here too. It has been an agonizing time for Joe, and he's really glad to hear that Ramapa is back. They have both come a long way. Trust and friendship have replaced disbelief and suspicion, and all because of a wolf. And then, Joe gets to witness just how this animal tests them. Within a couple of days, out of the blue, bent ear strikes. No one has any idea where he came from. His partner is there too. It's fantastic. They have both survived the poisoning. Finally, after so long on his case, Joe sees Bent Ear do the robbing for himself. Of course, only after he has made the kill. But he also observes a really remarkable reaction from Rabapa's group. No one goes after the wolves and there's no talk of revenge. Joe desperately wants to know why. When most local shepherds want to wipe out wolves, why are nomads, like Rampapa, so lenient towards them? It's only now he reveals the story which his people have believed in for generations. Once upon a time, there were three brothers. When it came to sharing their livestock, one of them was betrayed by the other two out of greed. This one brother cursed the other two to roam these lands forever and took to the forest. We are those roaming the world and he shadows us in the form of a wolf. He keeps coming back in his wolf skin to take his share and remind us of our greed. After all, the wolf is our own brother. How can we kill or even hurt him? What a belief. Maybe one of Bent Ear's survival secret lies within the beliefs of Rambapa. Next morning, Joe and Ambrish are on the trail of Bent Ear's family again. If they are denning by now, they'll have to sneak through farms and pastures to reach their den. It's not an easy task to carry stolen food long distances without being noticed. To work out whether wolves have gone after the kill, Joe and Ambrish speak to the farmers. They only get vague clues and they hurry to search all the possible den sites in the vicinity. Eventually, on the trail of Bent Ear, they reach a place about 10 kilometers from where they found the poisoned wolves. Here they stumble upon fresh wolf scat. It's very near a rocky area full of holes and crevices. They decide to stake it out from a distance. A couple of hours pass by. Then suddenly, they see something. Not bent ear, but a strange animal. Its face is more like a jackal, but it's the size of a young wolf. It has a reddish coat, a color that's never been reported for an Indian wolf before. It's a truly unique find. But why is this animal so tense? And 
Here is why. There's bent ear. Bent ear's partner is there too. She heads straight for a deep fissure in the rocks. That's the den. Bent Ear has not only survived, but the family has a new litter. Maybe the dead wolves were his offspring. It can't be just luck or coincidence that's allowed Bent Ear to survive for so long. He must have learned how to avoid the traps, nets and even poison. Even so, to reach the great age of seven or eight years in this hostile human environment seems like a miracle. The belief of brotherhood might have come in handy too. Only the shrewdest of the pups will live on, which, if any, will follow in their father's legendary footsteps. The young reddish wolf reappears in the hillock. And just when everything seemed picture perfect, Bent Ear knows he's there, but does nothing. Could this be another son? Joe has tracked Bent Ear for nearly two years. His offspring from previous years were all normal wolf pups, and most of them are now dead. If this young reddish wolf is not related to Bent Ear, where did it come from? And how can Bent Ear tolerate it so close to his den? Has Bent Ear got something new to pull out of his hat again? The stranger goes right up to the mouth of the den, and the pups seem to know him well too. It's incredible and quite magical. It could be another of Bent Ear's wily survival strategies in a critical time. To tolerate, perhaps even adopt a young unrelated wolf for extra help in raising the pups. Just when Joe thinks that his journey is coming to an end, it seems to begin again. The fact that these nomadic shepherds and wild wolves still roam the plains of South Central India appears more and more like a surreal image. But Bent Ear, Joe's big bad wolf, seems to have triumphed even in reality. Though he loses most of his offspring, he lopes on in his wolf skin, reminding us of his tenacity and his intelligence, and perhaps of our greed and intolerance. Myth and reality have blurred in this land. But it has helped Joe learn something quite profound about the nature of coexistence. How a vanishing nomadic culture and a species that is disappearing from a landscape are clinging to each other along a silken thread of belief. A belief 
in brotherhood.